Okay, we're going right starting. now. Said, there you go. Well, I understand I'm internationally known, so <laughs> I'm going to show you a hometown secret that I use to paint with that makes me unique among watercolors. And that is, I'm not going to draw. There's no drawing involved in this wow. process. I do everything with blue 3M tape, painter's tape. Wait a minute. This stuff? Exactly, exactly. Oh, great. That's how I start everything. Okay. I was trained as an oil painter, uh -huh. and this is my way of blocking in a painting. But with watercolor, nobody does this. They normally will use misket or frisket to hold out whites. Right. This was my crutch. I This whole style started basically because I didn't know how to hold out a white when I started painting 14 years ago in watercolor. So this was my way of keeping up with people like Jim Millard, Jude Maxian, who are the masters of holding out whites. And here's this young kid coming along trying to compete with them and I couldn't do it. So this was the cheat when I started it, okay? So today what you're gonna see is I'm working on a full sheet piece of uh, 140 pound watercolor paper by Arches cold press. And I'm gonna use the three, and 3M by the way is the only tape that will look, work with this uh, method mm -hmm. and with this paper. I haven't been successful with any other paper in this technique. You can't use Fabriano, it's too soft, that type of thing. All right. But the blue tape is medium tack. It's 3M number 2090. That's, right. you go to Home Depot. Well, good, then you don't mind if I interrupt every so often with yeah. questions that I have? Not at all. Perfect. Not at all, great. Take it away, Chuck. But they have to be intelligent questions. Oh God, thanks. <laughs> there you so go. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a quick intro because we've only got a little bit of time here. I'm going to do a quick intro in the tools I use, which, of course, I just explained. I use 2-inch 3M blue painter's tape. I use a 4-inch or a 3-inch, I think this is, uh, Richardson flat wash brush. Normally, I use a 6-inch brush, but I'm not going to do that today. Wow. I'm going to show you how to use the magic eraser, which is how I remove color. Love because it. when I started, they said I couldn't remove, once you put watercolor right. down, that's where it stays, and I, you can't tell me what to do. So I said, no, I'll find a way of getting around it. So there is There's a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. How clever. I've got my little hair dryer here because it's gonna get crazy. I work vertically, so everything's gonna drip and be messy. And I put a big tarp down so I don't get the gallery messed up. And then you're gonna hear this once in a while during the demo, so I apologize for the noise, but sometimes people like the fact I get drowned out. Well, also, you're not going to completely finish the piece. No, I'm going to do an intro for the technique of how of the mechanics of how I do this. That's the important part. This this kind of technique usually takes you a long time, doesn't it? The paintings that I share online, you can see them on my YouTube. You can see them in person on my Facebook page. I brought some in with with. There we go. Okay. And you're so good. This tape, sure. this painting was done with tape on location. Yeah, there we go. And sorry for the glare, but this was done on location at Beaumont Park across the street. And I started with the blue tape, just taping out the shape of the trees and the roller coaster. That's how it started, just in blue tape. And then I took a big brush and I pounded color onto it. That's usually what I do to get the feeling or the narrative of the painting going. If I want something exciting, my strokes are big and splashy. If I want it quiet, they're horizontal and gray, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. This particular subject wants to be exciting, so it had a lot of splashy color, a lot of blues and things like that. I'm gonna use, I only use four or five brushes. A number 20, or number 36 mop brush that I use, doesn't really matter the brand because everybody will go out and buy their own. I use a number 11 X-Acto blade. Uh, number 11 because it's very sharp. There's no other blade that I know will work with this technique. And I'll explain that later. I use a one inch flat and a toothbrush. And no, that's not the one I brushed my teeth with this morning. <laughs> and I use about a number 12 round. For my detail strokes, I have a smaller brush, like a number six or so. I don't see it here right off. But uh, I don't use real small brushes when I do my details. Uh, I also use a spray bottle to keep things flowing. When I need a bloom, and I use blooms on purpose, I, they're not mistakes on my paintings. I embrace mistakes. It's watercolor, you have to. It is not a forgiving medium. Uh, but I'll spray certain places 
uh, and make it wet again. I also use, let's see, where did they go here? Cardboard to stamp with. Corrugated cardboard to make patterns with. Mm -hmm. And 60 grit sandpaper. That's how I normally will start a well, painting. Well, I want to see the sandpaper. 60 That's grit. Okay, let's show you the sandpaper first. This just prepares the surface to give you some texture. The way I phrase it to most people is I like the etch quality that it'll give me. Uh -huh. Today, I'm going to try and do a rendition of this painting, which uh, is called First Friday Fish. It's a piece I sold years ago. And everything you see here was taped out originally, and then I threw the color on it. But I sanded the piece to begin with to give certain elements some texture. So because we're working vertically, I like the vertical idea because vertical usually means exciting. Horizontal means it's kind of quiet, that type of thing. Not a rule, just a guideline. But I will come through and use the sandpaper to give my surface a roughed up texture. I'm destroying the sizing on the paper. I'm not mm -hmm. destroying the paper. That's the other reason I like 140 pound because it will take a lot of punishment. So I'll put a couple lines in. There's something there. Your cloth is down on the floor, it dropped. Oh, thank you. There, you see it? Oh, I had to bend over, of course. Then I'll come through with a larger brush. This is normally what I like to paint with, a number. <laughs> it's not even a number, it's just a giant six inch pig bristle brush. I love this thing, but today I would get the gallery too dirty, so we're not gonna use that. But I am gonna take all the sanded parts off my, my paint, because I don't want that in my paint. Okay, so we're gonna start. Everybody with me so far? You got yeah, it? Yeah, of course. Okay, we're gonna start by designing. Wait, you're not gonna do a pencil sketch first? No, no pencil. No Never? thinking, you can't, this technique will not allow you to think like we normally do. The more you think, the worse painter you're gonna be when you try and do this technique. You need something that's very intuitive. That's wow. what I'm known for. Wow. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take a straight piece of tape. I wish I could turn this into a dub, that'd be really funny. But <laughs> I'm gonna tear it down the middle. Wow, that's a pretty nice tear. Now I've got two surfaces or two edges, I've got a straight edge and I've got a wobbly edge, okay? Mm -hmm. So the hardest part about this technique is you have to kind of think backwards. I want my whites to be the last thing to get color, okay? So the whites are the first thing I'll put in the painting and I'll kind of get an idea for what I want that to be and what I want that to be. And you can see already, I've got an interesting proportion to my composition. It doesn't mean squat yet because it, you don't even know what it is. Yeah. So I will come in and take my X-Acto knife. Ow. Ooh. And they're really sharp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the bottom part of this, since it's a seascape, what I'm gonna do, and we're in Carlsbad, so you do seascapes, I'm gonna come through, this is gonna be a wave. And I'm gonna come through and I'm gonna design the top part of the wave. Aren't you afraid you'll go through to your paper? Sure, but <laughs> if I do, it's no big deal. You throw some tape on the backside and it's fine. No, I'm uh, kidding. I've learned now over the years to let the knife, I just put enough pressure on the knife so I know it'll go through the tape and not through the paper. And on this side, I may change the wave up a little bit. <laughs> just as the design Thing. doesn't mean anything right now this is all just happenstance mm -hmm. but I will say it is extremely important to have a sharp blade yeah. but I'll probably go through two or three blades in this this painting wow. now the nice thing about this is now I've got another shape I can use somewhere as another wave or maybe part of what I'm going to do with the shacks or whatever let's make this part of the pier system then I'm going to set this guy on Again, I'm not thinking that much. 
You can tell by how fast I'm working. That's kind of interesting. It's an interesting shape. <laughs> yeah, so we'll just leave it. Because they're gonna be piers, I'm gonna turn the bottom of it a little bit so it's curled. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. And I'm gonna come in and take the top shape off slightly and off slightly. And I'll move this up just because it's an interesting shape. Nothing in my head other than this is kind of the general shape I want to work with. If I decide, like I told you, these are going to be white, so I want to make sure that these are on top of that because I'll take these off at some point in the, in the painting uh, once I put the paint down. But I'll want to leave my waves. Now this one, we're going to bring in, let's see, there we go, the second set of waves. That works. Just give it a different shape. Doesn't take a lot of thinking. Okay, and I save all these little shapes just in case. Because <laughs> right now I don't need them, but you never know. Uh, so for example, let's say we've got the bottom of the shack. Still a very interesting uh, composition. Yeah. It's the kind of thing where it looks like an abstract. That's what's in my head. It's just to buy the space up to make it interesting. So let's get a shack started. And I don't mean O'Neill. R R R. <laughs> now I want to be careful getting near the top or the edge of my paintings because I don't want what they call um, a tangency. Yeah. Tangencies, a curve or a straight next to another straight or a curve will tend to flatten space. So what I want to do is I want to create a roof line for a shack and I'll probably, let's just put a chimney on that guy just because I can. <laughs> The whole idea behind what I'm taping is I don't want any color to initially go down on this. I'm still using the same tape I had before. You also need to make sure that when you get ready to paint that you take your fingernail or your thumbnail and press the tape down. Because if you don't do that, the water, especially for as much water and color as I'm going to use, yeah. is going to want to get behind the tape, tape yeah. especially working vertically. Okay, so in this case... Do you case, normally work vertically or are you doing it just because we're filming today? No, I like working vertically. Oh, you do? I always work on a slight, slight slant because you want the watercolor to move. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will always mm -hmm. set another piece of tape, you know, another one of these under my, my uh, painting if I'm working on a table just so the watercolor has some place to go. The only time I work flat is if I put a big wash in and I want it to really settle, settle after down, time. Yeah, yeah. you gotta give, gotta give the watercolor a little bit of time to do its thing. So now we're gonna put the ribs in the shaft. And the simplest method to do there is people will try and cut all these slices and make them perfect. You don't need to. You can cut once, move the tape slightly, cut again because mm. every time you do that you'll get a really nice line mm -hmm. with what you did before and because I want this to be kind of funky kind of abstract now I'm starting to get some interesting shapes going it's all about shape that's what this whole technique is about composing with shapes instead of lines you get in more trouble trying to draw all this stuff out mm. Mm. because your mind's in, involved and you're trying to do a final painting. The thing about me, I don't care about it. We're not even close to being done with this. These are normally 100-hour paintings. I can spend 100 hours on something. This one, for example, was about 45 hours when I finished it. You can also see the wave. 
Mm -hmm. That's the same technique. There's your pier. I hand cut a little bird. I cut I, I uh, cut the sails in there as well. But then I came back in and you can see here, I actually took the sandpaper over the paint. I removed it. Right. So the sandpaper not only starts to give you a, a edge texture on the paper, but then you can come back and erase the painting, like lifting the color. So that's the idea. All right, so we got the shack kind of started and I want to put a window in there. So not really a window, but it gives me an idea where a window could be. And I like to utilize these shapes if I can, depending. So it doesn't really matter how. it off the roll. Yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter how I cut it. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so we got that, and then we cut this. I don't particularly need my window square, because I think it's more interesting as a shape if it's not. Right. It's like if you have a bunch of mm. windows in a painting, you mm. never paint all the panes of glass the same way. You always do them a little bit different, make it interesting. So now I got my window to the world. And we're gonna come through and make some more, because it's got a sill underneath, see this is how my brain works. This is where everybody gets lost. You have to be a little nuts <laughs> to think like this. Well, I see where the 100 hours come to play. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I will I will tape. The shortest time I've taped is about nine and a half hours. Woo! This will be a record for me. So when I just finished, in fact, um, Crystal Pier Persuasion that I just sold and went into Washington. <laughs> That's a great title. Yeah, uh, it was of the Crystal Pier. And so I went Crystal Pier Persuasion. I love, you know, right? And uh, it was about nine to 15 hours, I think, of taping. And then I spent, I don't know, 70, 80 hours doing that particular piece. Okay, same thing over and over and over again. And you'll notice that every, I'm not worried about consistency. The less consistent the shapes are, the more interesting the painting will be. Yeah, you're not measuring. No, I'm not an architect or a builder, and there's no OSHA code, <laughs> so I'm not worried about it. Nobody's going to sue me until they buy the house and fall down on them. <laughs> All right, so there's our shack, and I told myself before I got here today that I wanted a place to go from the ocean to the shack, so we're going to start giving you a way of getting there. So is that shack going to be your focal point? Yes. That is the place that I want you to sort of concentrate on. Okay. The nice thing about this technique is, again, I can change my mind if I want. If I decide at the last minute that I don't want the shack there, right. I can move it someplace else. I've already got the pieces and parts. The nice thing about the medium tack is you can reposition it. Mm -hmm. and put it down again. The, the light tack tape that most people use won't work because it comes off. But if you were to reposition it because you didn't like the composition, the way it was starting out, you would have to do it prior to laying down any color, right? Uh, yes and no. Otherwise, you're not saving your white. True, but with the magic eraser, you can bring your whites back. I forgot about Mr. Clean. Yeah. Now, Mr. <laughs> Clean, I started using it. I watched a video that was very interesting. Huh. A lady that did a watercolor of a boat in a river. Uh -huh. And she painted everything and forgot the boat. So what she did was she put the shape of the boat on the painting, and she magic erasered everything out, and she got almost bright white. Wow. You can only get 90% of the color out. The tooth of the paper on cold press will always hold some color. But I can get 90% out and uh, pretty successful with that. That's very cool. So what I'm doing now is I'm creating this neat old rickety kind of stairway. That will lead your eye into it. 